thanks everyone for joining in today. Um, just firstly, we're aiming to run this webinar for around 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and we're going to be looking at um, the handling of lupin seeds and the impacts mechanical damage can have on the germination. Um, so just a bit of background around this project. Um, the, the, I guess the issue came from a GRDC grower network discussion, um, probably around five years ago. Um, there were some concerns, I think out of the 2017 season around split seed in lupins. Um, so there, there was a few projects funded by GRDC um, and we were funded to do a benchmarking study um, to see what was actually happening in the field in terms of um, lupin germination percentages and, and, and how lupin seed was being handled by growers. Um, so the majority of this work was conducted in the 2019 harvest um, and into the 2020 seeding. Uh, we did continue it and do a smaller um, subset of growers in the 2020 harvest um, and, and did a bit of work into 2021 as well. Um, we're now at the end of the project um, and we're basically just wanting to share a few of the results with you all today. Um, we thought it was a timely opportunity to do this, given we're leading into the 2022 harvest. Um, so we're going to share some of the some of the findings from our benchmarking, and we've also got um, Glenn Reithmuller from the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development here today, who's going to share some of the practical tips and tricks to handling seed, um, in particular lupin seed. Um, just to note that this webinar is being recorded and we'll make it available um, on the Leaby website and it's likely we'll rerun this again um, at, at different times throughout at maybe next year um, at key times. Um, and I just need to thank GRDC um, for the funding and also um, DPIRD for their support um, through, throughout the project as well. We've run a number of workshops um, and we've had um, really good support from from DPIRD researchers, so we appreciate that. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an introduction and show you some of the data, um, and then I'm going to hand over to Glenn, um, who's going to be sharing some of the tips around how to proceed. Uh, I'd, before I go into that, just if there is any questions, um, feel free to either write it into the chat um, or just jump in at any time um, and, and ask it. So just a bit of a project outline. Um, the benchmarking study we completed was of 27 lupin paddocks in 2019, um, which we repeated with a smaller subsection of six growers in 2020. That's the harvest of 2020. Um, we collected samples from each of those paddocks um, prior to harvest and post harvest. Then, then again, prior to seeding and, and post seeding. Um, and they're all sent away to deeper seed testing to um, give us a germination percentage. Um, one of the notes, we did try to do some backyard germination testing um, with the aim of comparing what we could do at home with, with what can be done in a lab. Um, and the resounding result of that was the backyard germination testing failed. We had all sorts of problems with seed going mouldy um, and, and and trying to do it in, in February, it was, it was really hot. So keeping you know, moisture levels um, at the required amount was really difficult. Um, so the message here is definitely use industry standards. It's a quick term, turnaround test for germination um, and it gives you a really accurate result. Um, we also did some rotor speed testing um, with, with a four or five grow, uh, four growers. We didn't find any significant differences in rotor speed uh, and the impact on germination. Um, and we also did some auger journey experiments, which we'll talk about a little bit later on as we go. Uh, here's just a couple of photos of, um, of a couple of the growers that were participating um, and we're just bagging up some lupins. Um, it was quite an intensive 
for the project and we were collecting a lot of samples. So we appreciate all the growers that, uh, that were involved in their time. So what did the results tell us? Um, so from the 2019 harvest going into the 2020 seeding, uh, we saw a decline um, from the pre-harvest samples that we took, which were um, pressed by hand in our lab. Most of the pre-harvest samples came back, uh, pretty much all of them, came back at around 96% germination, which, which is pretty good. Uh, and from there, there we saw a, a bit of a decline down um, as that seed was handled more till we got to post seeding, which was the sample was taken from the boot of the seeder, um, where we were down to about 76% germination on average. Uh, one of the things that I noted out, out of that data was that um, the range of germination percentages at post seeding was, was, was pretty high. So there were some samples or some growers that stayed at around 90s in the high 90s of germination. Um, but there was others that uh, were down at 50%. So there was something going on there. Um, difficult to unpack exactly what process um, caused that that decline with each of those. Um, there was a lot of variables, obviously, when you're doing this sort of work. But uh, yeah, quite obviously, with that data, there was a decline, and, and it's likely the compounding effect of all the different handling techniques has probably had an impact um, come seeding time. So, like I said, the germination percentage range was at post seeding was between 50% and 96%. Uh, across all those samples, the grain moisture at harvest was 9.5%, um, and the average manganese content was uh, 0.19, which is all, all of them were above the threshold, um, which I think is 0.15, the manganese content of the seed. Um, so this was just a, a summary of the varieties. Uh, we had Barlock, Karamup, uh, Gunyidi, Durian, and Mandalup. Uh, we had a lot more Durian growers um, in the benchmarking. Um, I, I would sort of caution this data. It, it is benchmarking data. It's, it's, um, there is a bit of a trend towards Durian and Mandalup having lower germination percentages, but uh, correlation doesn't always equal causation. So, um, I'd take it with a grain of salt. It, it might have just been that some of the growers um, yeah, were more harsh on them with their mechanical handling um, that were growing mandal up. So it wasn't that much of a controlled experiment. Um, but I thought I'd just show the summary of the uh, the varieties here. Um, in the 2020 harvest with the six growers that uh, we continued on with, um, there was a was again a, a slight trend at post seeding, um, average of around 80, 83% um, at post seeding compared to 90% at post harvest. Um, we, we didn't take any pre harvest uh, samples on this occasion, but there's still that downward trend. Um, that leads us on to the auger journey experiment. Um, so, what we did here was we had a seed source. Um, in this instance, it was durian lupins with no manganese applied. And we ran the seed through uh, two different augers. Uh, we ran it through 10 times, taking a sample at the end of each auger journey. Um, so what this is showing us here, we're looking at a range of germination percentages from 99 down to 93. So it's all above um, sort of recommendations for germination rates, um, albeit there is a slight decline there um, and, and slightly more pronounced with the older auger as well. Um, and Glenn might touch on some of the older work that was done by DPIRD in relation to auger, auger journeys and quality of augers a bit later on. Uh, we did repeat that again um, with a different, uh, it was a separate experiment really, but it was with a Gunyidi seed source with manganese applied. Um, and 
almost a straight line there between all the journeys, um, 95% down to 94. So um, nothing really to be concerned about there. It's, it's a bit difficult to compare the two experiments given they were separate seed sources. Um, it might have been nice to compare a, a similar seed source with and without manganese, um, but, but that's not how we do it in this case. So they're really treated as two separate experiments. Um, so that's pretty much the summary of the data. I, I just wanted to um, just give the Harvester Setup Workshops a plug, which is part of um, a Harvest Loss project um, before I hand over to Glenn. So we, these are happening next week, one in Meriden, one in Dalwoni and one in Chapman Valley. Um, and there'll be sort of four hours of, um, of hands-on practical demonstrations around setting up harvesters. So, relevant to this project, um, but also from a harvest loss perspective as well. Um, it's really important. So um, that's pretty much all I've got as an introduction. Um, I might hand over to Glenn now, and he's going to take us through some of the practical tips and tricks. OK. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris, for inviting me to do a chat on this. If I disappear, the lights came out. Here we go. Um, I don't know whether you can see my cursor on the screen or not. Um, but that could be handy later. Yes, yes, we can see it. You can see it? Excellent. All right, well, I'll just touch on a few issues. I'll start on some of the older germination work, which I think is still relevant, um, and then move on to a little bit of the harvesting stuff as well. Um, um, Ed Blanchard did some work back in 94, um, looking at this germination problem for harvest through to seeding. And the upshot of that earlier work was really um, the um, the seed it had to be above 11 percent, uh, really, because uh, anything lower than that is interesting that you got nine and a half average. Because the lower the moisture, the more damage that can affect uh, the seed, and, and and certainly crack it or damage the the coat that you can't actually see any problem, but it actually damages the inside um, of the seed, so it doesn't germinate so well. Um, keeping the Peripheral speed of the rotor to less than 12 meters a second um, was also handy, and <clears throat> removing every second wire. It's interesting that uh, he did a heap of work on ordering and very little effect on germination. It's a bit like what you found there too. Um, this is example here. I don't know. Oh, my mouse won't show it now. Um, just with these danger lupins, um, peripheral speed there are 15, 20, and 25 and 30 meters per second. Now, when you're harvesting cereals, you're up around the 25 to 30 meters a second. Um, but as the moisture of the seed dried, the germination percentage dropped a lot. So you can see there, if you have high, high impact speed of 30 meters a second and 9% and seed, you're only getting 70% germination. So admittedly, you, you wouldn't have been using 30 meters a second, but see, even at 15 or so, it still still brings it down. Now, he concluded that 12 was a good cutoff, that you didn't lose too much if you stayed with 12. Uh, now, an example of what the harvesters, the current harvesters say, I just uh, look at 12 meters a second and what rotor speed each of these headers here is. So the case is only 300. Uh, RPM. The New Holland is a slightly smaller rotor, so it's a bit higher at 410, and the others are still around the 300. So it's fairly slow rotor speed to, to get that 12 meters a second. Now, there's always a compromise in harvesting, and that's capacity. So if you've got a big crop, a big bulk of material, you tend to still want to keep the, the rotor speed up a bit. Otherwise, if you get a, a slug, it can actually kill your motor. So you're, some people would err on the side of higher than lower. But if you've got a big crop and, a, and just uh, not a lot of grain, well, then it's cushioned by the, the crop anyway. So the damage to the seed is probably less anyway. So that's just like a, uh, a suggested minimum anyway. Uh, here's an example of the wide web. The front concave there was the standard serial concave. In this case, Jeff just happened to be field peas, but the peas just pretty well block that serial concave. So you don't want that to happen. So the, for lupins, you really need the wider open area to let the seed out. 
uh, otherwise it stays in there longer and more, more chance of damaging it. Some more things from that work, uh, don't store the lupins with green radish, which lowers the germination. Um, and use a minimum airspeed on the air seeder and a minimum impact primary splitter. By that means that um, some of the splitters on some air seeders are reverse impact. So, and if they've got a hard top, you can actually damage the seed if you're putting a very high airspeed on, say to, to stop blockages, but then your, your hoses, if they're not all going downhill from the, the head itself to the time, you can get away with a lower airspeed if you do that. If it's a nice downward trend all the way, you can get away with a lower airspeed and that'll damage the seed less. And he found that with those uh, uh, particularly air seeders that have like a splitter like your hand goes along and then splits into say uh, uh, tubes going out horizontally rather than in reverse impact, those splitters tended to have less damage to the seed than the reverse impact. Um, Measuring, of course, the germination before seeding, because if once you get down to 75%, the seed is probably not that great anyway. So your, your vigor is also uh, lower. So low germination percentage is one thing, but vigor is another. So generally they recommended not to use it under 75%. Now there was a thought he, he tried, this electrolyte solution test, which only takes 24 hours. And in soybean, there's been shown to relate to field emergence better than germination percentage. So we thought, here's a go, this is a nice quick test. And all you do is drop some seed into a distilled water sample and then test the electrolyte solution for uh, how many salts are in it. And so if it's got a slightly damaged seed coat, it'll leak out salts into the uh, solution to be measured. But unfortunately, the two experiments showed really no relationship with field emergence, uh, but three did some a little bit. So he concluded that it might be worth further investigation, but I haven't seen any other work on that since. But also soybeans have got a, a thinner seed coat than um, uh, lupins. So I suspect that might be part of the reason we didn't have so much luck with that. It might be relevant to field peas because field peas have a thinner coat than uh, uh, lupins. Uh, don't keep rain affected lupins for seed because the, um, the wetting and drying can uh, reduce the germination. And in that work where he did higher seed rates of 80 kilos a hectare had a better germination than the 40. And that could have been the cushioning effect from say extra seed and fertilizer perhaps in the, in the airline might've reduced the airspeed a bit. And also the cushioning of seed on seed might've had uh, less effect on the damage to the seed. Uh, just a, an example here that uh, from Marty Harry's talk about how rain can affect seed. On the right hand side there, you've got Wayne Parker looking at uh, some seed that's harvested after rain versus before the rain. So it's definitely better seed. I guess that's that's what he pretty well found. And then that's in 2005. And then of course in 15 and 16, there was 40 mils of rain. I'm not sure during lupin. So that can still happen at any time. Could happen this year again. So that's something to be aware of. Um, this experiment that Marty did, looking at wetting and drying cycles with only 10 millimetres of rain. So one cycle dropped at five to 10%, two cycles, 10 to 20, and three cycles up to 45%. So certainly the wetting and drying cycles is, is not good for loop and germination. Now, I couldn't find any storage stuff for lupins as far as germination, temperature and moisture, but I did find one for soybeans by these guys in Brazil. So at this storage temperature of 20 degrees in a silo and say, I've actually had an aeration silo here on some canola in December and I got the seed down to 14 degrees temperature. So there's, there's not a problem to get down to 20, it's easy enough. People think that you never get it to 20 in December, but you can because it's pumping in cooler air from the morning. When I jumped in the silo, my feet just about froze. I couldn't believe how cold the, the seed was. But anyway, here it's say 20 degrees Celsius. The top lines there is uh, the drier seed, the 11.2% and then the 12.8%. Uh, so that's no problem. But when you get to 14.8% moisture, then the storage, uh, the germination dropped off with time. Uh, that's at 20 degrees. You go up to 30 degrees, and of course, then they all started getting affected. Still the best was the driest, 11.2 was still the highest, uh, then 12.8, and then the 14 is less. And of course, once you get to 40 degrees, 
equal and they're all free set. Uh, it's a good thing that I guess your your survey there was 9.5% average, but there could be a few a few moist ones in there. But certainly you wouldn't want to keep it warm in a in a silo uh, if it's uh, still a bit moist. As a general rule, now this is from the um, GRDC Grow Notes. They suggest should be stored less than 13%, um, which is fair enough. Um, and keep the temperature around 20 and certainly below 25 if you can. Uh, it's advisable not to store with any contaminated green pods like with wild radish. Uh, here's an example from Marty's work, I think it was, with the manganese in the seed effect. So uh, when you get really low levels of manganese, you get um, um, split seed and therefore lower germination as well. Um, so, but I think your samples are all okay. Um, the high temperatures can volatilize those toxic compounds in the radish pod, which can kill the lupin seed. And that can happen fairly quickly. So even temporary storage can be damaging. Even a few days, they said, was, uh, was enough to damage the seed. So that's something to watch out for. Hopefully we haven't got too many radish in our lupins anymore, but if it does, that, that can be a problem. Um, Interesting, painting silos wide. I've seen more of that in Queensland than I have over here, but it can actually keep the, the grain inside four degrees cooler. Um, the problem is cost and how to do it because most silos are delivered in the shiny steel and um, yeah, painting at white costs as well as uh, uh, takes longer and costs more. Uh, the bigger silos generally remain cooler because the small silo has got more uh, tin work compared to the same tonnage, say, than the big size. So they tended to stay a bit cooler. Just moving on to some practical stuff on harvesting now. Um, the, um, the one way to certainly check that you're not losing grain out through the harvester anyway is these drop trays. And this is an example here, of one from uh, primary sales, but there's a few different ones on the market. So you're simply uh, driving along, have it all set up nicely and then press a button and it drops the magnets from a tray onto the ground. And then as the harvester goes over it, the, the seed and rubbish gets collected in the tray and you stick it through a little cleaner and measure how much grain is there. So without measuring the losses, you really have no idea what's going through the harvester. But the front end is probably the most critical thing with lupins. And this is where our earlier work found that certainly reducing the shaking uh, of the stalk with say double density knife guards there on the left hand side was better than the standard three inch which which pushes the, the stem a long way to the side before it's cut and that shaking is what uh, seems to break the pods off before the before it even getting to the front and another problem with the knife and this is from a brand new machine at the Darren Field Day the left hand arrow there you can see the knife section is is cutting on the right position there on the knife guard itself, like a pair of scissors, so it's flush with that. The arrow on the right, you can see the next little uh, uh, guard there is a couple of mils higher. And, even, and the one further over is at the top as well. And that's not in the best position for cutting. That'll tear the plant off. And if it's got to tear it off, chances are it'll propel it forward as the motion of the cutter going forwards will tend to tear it. And, that tends to fly the pods further forward too. So it doesn't take much to get a, on a, these uh, guards can be altered. So if you hit a rock, that's what happens, but then you can just bend them up. And talking to quite a few of the dealers, they say there's no problem of putting a lever on there and just bending it up because it actually bends the support at the back, not the actual guard itself, because the guard itself, they're quite hard material, but where it, um, just bends that little guard at the back and you can get that knife back nice and, and flush again. Uh, this is a raised knife kit on a belt front and you can get, uh, this happened to be primary sales extension uh, fingers. You can get the pink ones there that are straight, which is what we were using on our case front. But some of the fronts like John Deere might have a, uh, the knife angle might be lower or pointed down more when it gets low to the ground. So they're angled ones, the blue ones there, uh, help catch pods um, on the, uh, the knife sections that are more tapered downwards. Uh, the air reel is an interesting one because they, they really do work. Um, this is uh, the Crary reel 
was originally made by Harvest Air in Perth, and then they had it, uh, I think they sold the patent to Carreri, and now Carreri are making them, and they're bringing them back in via primary sale, uh, via Harvest Air again, sorry, and so the, the people that have these reckon they're great, and the advantage is that you can just lower those air uh, tubes down when you have a low crop, and lift them out of the way when you have a big crop where they're not needed. So it's a, uh, the best of both worlds. But like everything, of course, it costs. But if you've got big area lupins, it's, uh, I reckon it's worth a look. We did try in really short lupins, these, uh, this black core flute a few years ago. Uh, I had one piece per turn of the reel going round just to sweep it off the knife. Um, but there's better material on the market now. Um, you still can, or well, some people tried brushes. I think uh, uh, Bob Nixon tried these brushes, but the brushes tend to catch material in them. So and it's not as clean and it should be black as well. So at nighttime, you don't get reflection in your eyes from the, from the lights. Um, but uh, this one and a half mil high density polyethylene sheeting is, um, is a handy thing to put on the finger time reels just for, just for really short lupins where you've got a problem. Um, this is Dylan Parkhouse at Keller Baron. He put them on every one of the sections of the reel, which I thought, hmm, you won't be able to see the knife because we tried that and you can't see the knife. But he said, well, they've, their machine has sent height sensors anyway, so the front can float along the ground, so he didn't need to see the knife. But driving along beside with his uh, dad was, uh, you could see that any pods that were being flown forwards tended to catch on those uh, uh, pieces of sheeting and flip back in. So he thought it was it was still better than nothing. And there it is just zip tied onto the reel and you see those uh, uh, pipes underneath there are the, uh, that's the sensors for the height control. And um, yeah, but if you, you take them off for bigger crops or cereals because that uh, that edge coming down into the crop could knock more, uh, you know, like barley or, or wheat heads off. So you'd take them back off again for uh, for the normal cereals. Um, moving on to how to keep the grain cool. Now there are different aeration systems on the market. I've just picked on one here, um, and they they make them so that they can blow in the coolest air of the day. I tried it at Meriden just with a timer, and I managed to jag it, but you know, you've got to be ch checking the temperature all the time. Whereas this um, automatically does it for you. And there, there are bigger models that can do several uh, um, silos at once. So they can, same thing, uh, measure the uh, humidity and air uh, condition and then blow in the coolest uh, air for the time of the day. Um, you do have to have electricity, of course. So that's one of the problems and uh, certainly we have some nice uh, pink and gray cockies that just love chewing plastic. So that needs to be covered pretty well if there's wires leading up to a silo. Uh, they also suggest using ventilation in, this, in the, uh, the top as well, because if you're going to aerate it to cool it, you've got to have airflow. So uh, these um, lids that they have, they automatically seal again when the air is turned off. So then you can gas your silo if you're putting cereals in it. And I think uh, just that's about it. Now, just a few thoughts, of course, just keeping the, the harvesting as early as possible. Uh, you can deliver at 14%, um, but I'd say aim for 12, that keeps longer. And other work suggests if it gets really dry, it can, get, it can develop hard seediness. So if it gets too dry, um, it takes a bit to wet it up again. Um, so you might get you know, staggered germination with the lupins. Of course, the adequate manganese fertilizer is important. Um, harvesting in the, at night or when the humidity is high to reduce that pod shattering is uh, certainly a good thing to do. Uh, I suggest calibrate the yield monitors, not only for, for uh, yield, but also for that moisture. So you can actually see that you can start earlier than you think. And don't keep rain affected lupins. Uh, paint the silos white if you uh, don't want to go cool it, or if you want to cool it without having to use aeration. Uh, but certainly aeration with automatic controllers is the bee's knees. And I think that's about it for me. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Glenn. Um, one of the things that 
I've been sort of thinking about in this space is is the compounding effect of um, of different processes. So when we did our rotor speed experiments, um, where we I think we had four growers do will harvest their lupins at um, a low rotor speed of yeah, 300 up to around 600 RPMs. Um, we didn't really see any differences between the two, but I, I sort of wonder whether over time, if, if you harvest at that higher rotor speed um, and then you're putting it through lots of augers um, and then maybe at seeding time, um, it, it, it's, it's sort of thrashed around a fair bit. Um, whether that compounding effect actually leads to a poorer germination in the paddock. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I tend to think that can be the case because you might find that, um, um, yes, it can sort of, that higher speed can just uh, damage the internals of the seed and you don't see that until later on after the storage time. So, uh, but, and also if the in that case where you did the rotor speed thing, I, I don't know whether your seed moisture was measured there, but if the moisture was a bit higher, that would cushion the effect of uh, uh, the inter increased rotor speed. Like I said in that diagram there, if you have really dry seed and high rotor speed, that's where you get most of the damage after it's been stored. You don't Physically, you don't see any problem at all in the seed coat. It's yeah. just the storage time, whether it's the temperature and uh, condition in the silo, but that effect um, does carry through. So I think it is a, a cumulative effect that you look at the seed and think it's fine or test it straight after the, uh, you know, impacting it, think, yep, that's good. But the time can uh, be the killer. Mm. We, we certainly found in the, um, in the post seeding collection, um, where we took it from the food, that, it, so that was our steepest decline from preceding to post seeding, so I think you might, yeah, you might be right with the seeding systems as well. And um, one thing that Rob mentioned, I think Rob's still there on on the um, on the webinar here today. It was um, the the tubing as well, air the tubing, and the quality of that can make a difference. Mm, yes, well, some tubing is um, uh, fairly smooth inside. Some have gone to rubber tubing, think it was a better material for impact but the trouble with rubber is that it's uh, got a higher friction coefficient so you generally have to put a higher airspeed on to push it through rubber hosing and so uh, that can have an effect and also bends uh, every time it takes a bend you'll tend to notice your air seeder tubes tend to wear out on a bend why is that because it's rubbing it harder when it's uh, the seed goes to the outer side of the bend and with the rubbing hardness there it can actually impact the seed as well so yeah, catching it at the base uh, of the boot after all the impacts. So you might have two reverse impacts plus hosing to get down to it. Um, years ago, shearers used to recommend take the cap off their heads and watch how high the, the seed would go in the air. If it went more than about three metres, back your wind speed off. But they also had a requirement that from that head, the seed hose was going downhill all the way. Uh, if it goes flat for a bit and then down, you need more airspeed to make sure it goes there. But uh, if it's a nice downhill run all the way from the head, then you can get away with a bit less airspeed. The complication is if, you, if you're putting on a hundred of super or something, of course, then you need a higher airspeed to keep the fertilizer going. Uh, those with suit and super together, you've got no choice there. You've got to keep that airspeed up. But if you're splitting it, um, there's a possibility of, you know, getting more air on this fertilizer perhaps than the seed. But at the same time, you don't want to have blockages. Um, so everything's a bit of a compromise. Rob, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think the issue with the hoses is very hard to determine at the time because you put them or you check them as the machine goes into the paddock, but you might do you know a couple of thousand hectares before you actually get to lupins. And that can be the difference between having a seed hose that's smooth inside or a very corrugated one with the wires just starting to be exposed. And you don't really discover that until very much later when the hose starts getting th so thin it makes a little hole or at the end of the season when you pull them off to replace them. Mm. Yeah, well, I hadn't thought of the, the, the damage from the internals of the uh, hose. Otter hoses have plastic 
uh, ribbing as well, not just steel, but if it's wire inside, it certainly definitely would uh, impact the seed more. Um, yeah, I guess it's one of those maintenance things, I suppose, to check on. Uh, one thing I noticed at Darren this year, that Osplay, I've got a heavier duty plastic type hose. So there is no wire to wear out and cause a lot more friction inside. Okay. So yep. I'll try next time we put hoses on. Mm, yeah, okay. And no, I didn't see that. Sound, that sounds like, well, anything to keep the inside of the tube smooth would be better because the seed then is not impacting on anything. And going around corners is always the problem. So if it's smoother, chances are it'll go around a, a corner easier than, uh, than a rough hose. Okay, any other questions from anyone in the audience? Can I ask another one? When you're doing high moisture lupins, it's very hard in our conditions to actually find a paddock that's uniform. So you might go from very high, they're almost too high, down to you know well below your twelve percent, you know, in the course of say a kilometre run. And that's a big issue that I had doing them fairly low rotor speeds because it was pretty easy to to block things up. Yeah. Okay. Well, where it's highly variable, it's probably better to actually. Uh desiccate with paracord or something because if it's uh if you really wanted to get into it and get them off before your barley or canola or something well then evening it up with uh, paracord is probably the one of the better options and it also controls any uh, weed seeds as well uh, but that certainly makes it flow a lot easier and probably less likely to block uh, if all the plant is dry there's nothing worse than an odd green one and it comes in a slug and that's where you can get blockages at low rotor speeds so uh, having it all desiccated beforehand because the alternative is I think that's the problem now I think most people then just wait for it to dry off because if you wait they'll all dry off but then the first ones get very dry and that like in the example there with averaging nine and a half percent moisture well there must be some in there that are probably seven percent and um, yeah they they don't like getting whacked around and they can possibly even get hard seededness because it takes longer to wet them up again for germination. Yes, yeah, I, I don't recall seeing any real correlation there when I put, mm. put the two together, but um, but yeah, but, it's, it's mm. obviously an issue. Rob, Rob, around your area, do you, do you see many people desiccating lupins or are they just pretty well wait for them to, to dry off? I think now that we've got our radish under control, there's a lot less desiccation on lupins. When there was radish that couldn't be controlled with the brew that Peter Newman brought out with the Metribuse and Simazine that sort of made lupins a clean crop, before that there was pretty much patches of radish you desiccated to try and get the radish and some of the ryegrasses if you had ryegrass. But it's more canola that gets desiccated to get that off first or as early as you can. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Mike, I can see you've uh, put your screen on there. So, <laughs> uh, Yeah, just um, our thoughts on the lupins. Um, we generally haven't, haven't found any germination issues in the past, apart from probably seven years ago when propizomide came on the market. It's, they're still very good germinations, just not what they were in the past. And that, along with the big opening rainfall events that make those propizomide, simazine, um, reflex, metribusion, mixers get fairly hot that seems to be our biggest concern I guess but uh, get, we're happy to take a, the trade off of clean crops and we're using probably out of label propizomide rates um, but have you got any thoughts on that Glenn we we're sort of not really seeing any too many issues with um, manganese or augers or um, cedar setups all those sorts of things but the uh, the, the chemical issue to us is um, is the biggest issue. So you're saying the, the chemicals are actually reducing your germination or is it just reducing your growth of the lupins? Well, our germination, like this year especially, um, there's a fair bit of sort of pockmark areas through the the paddock and you know, we're driving around the um, over to Gamelling and Darren and Wongan for football and fairly regularly and seeing a lot of what our, what our lupins used to look like with a completely flat surface and yeah, you know, I guess most people are probably still sticking at a litre of propizomide. We're well above that 
And I, I think it's actually stopping certain plants from coming up. And we're looking at whether to increase seeding rates, um, increase our depth a bit more, um, possibly reducing the propizomide again, um, or a combination of all three. But uh, yeah, that's that's more where we're looking at. Okay, no, well, I must admit I haven't heard of any uh, problems that way as far as germination. So I'll have to talk to some of the other guys that uh, do the uh, the chemical issues. Perhaps Army Hinder might have a thought on that. But yeah, certainly I can't uh, add anything to that that problem apart from always using the label rate. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no one uses off label rates. No, not at all. Mind you, the overlap problem if you don't have good spraying conditions and you have overlap then that could cause a bit of an issue but then you'd see that as a stripe uh, but most people have pretty good gps now for sprayers so that's probably less of an issue than it used to be apart from the ends where the, the little triangles if you've got section control tends to do double overlap yep. glenn i'm interested in the electrolyte solution what was the recipe for that oh, just, just simply distilled water or I guess whatever you, you buy the deionized water just so there's no salts in it and uh, put it in solution for 24 hours and then just have a um, the normal salt testing machine micrograms no milli micro siemens per meter per gram I think it was yeah and that's how it was expressed yeah. and um, yeah but there was certainly some of that soybean work suggested it was more important, but of the five tests I think Ed did, only two of them showed up any significance. We were sort of hoping it might have worked because it only taking 24 hours, it's quicker than having to, um, you know, try and do a germination test. And like you've pointed out, a backyard germination test is just not adequate. We we tried our own tests for germination too, but then what it come down to was you can you can count the number that have actually got the radical coming out, but then when we took it down to talk to our uh, people to do it and they said ah yeah but that's a uh, that's an abnormal seedling i said oh what's an abnormal i said well it comes out okay but then goes abnormal so if you don't count it as abnormal you're getting a false reading so we thought oh barley's to this we can't do this we'll just get them to do it um, for the abnormal seed so uh, yeah but the electrolyte thing was easy because it's just simply dunking you in the distilled water uh, the other thing that is handy for um I haven't tried it so much with lupin, but certainly with field peas that the seed coat is easier to crack and chickpeas is a quick test. It's just to drop, um, most people have household uh, bleach, sodium hypochlorate, it usually bleaches 4% in solution. So if you get a cup of hot tap water, so 50 degrees, whatever tap water is, 50-50 of household bleach brings it back to 2% sodium hypochlorite. And then you just drop some seeds into that. And if there's any damage to the seed coat, it'll just swell before your eyes like magic. Because it just, the, the bleach just goes in there and swells the seed. It's just awesome to see. Uh, but I think the seed coat of lupins is thick enough to probably not be damaged to let that in where you tend to get more. It's the time factor. I think that the seed coat might be dented and then it's damaged the internals rather than just... Uh, um, coming out and maybe that's why the solution test didn't work so well because the coat is so thick that you've got to get the internal solution to leak out into the distilled water but certainly uh, you know the 50 50 uh, sodium hypochlorite definitely worked the paper that i got that idea from suggested just using uh, normal 20 degree water but i found just the the tap with the hot tap water just sped it up because when you dilute it 50 50 it ends up being sort of 30 degrees anyway, and the bit warmer water just makes the um, um, seeds swell up so much faster. Okay. Mm. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Uh, this is probably a far-fetched one, um, but how, f how many lupins, how many hectares of lupins would we have to grow Australia-wide to get the podguard technology out of canola into lupins because I think that's our single biggest cost in terms of lost yield as well as uh, ongoing weed, volunteer lupin weed issues. Good question, Mark. Yes. Uh, yeah, certainly the losses 
I, I'm surprised when Chris came back with those loss measurements of like 400 kilos. I thought we, we were getting that 30 years ago and we're still getting it. So it is the pods flicking off. Um, but I don't know, the, uh, the breeders are lupins. I think they're still going for yield more than perhaps the, that pod trait, but, but we can only uh, ask them at the field days, I suppose, and see if we can get someone to bite and uh, if that can be put into lupins. Um, but yeah, that front loss is definitely the, the highest loss at harvest anyway. Definitely. Yeah, I think um, the results from the, from the overall project, Glenn, it was around 8%, I think, from the front, which was the highest mm. of any crop measured. Yes, yep. And, and a total, yeah, 8 to 9% with the total losses of up to 12% in lupins, so fairly significant yeah, okay. amount. Oh, so there was still 4% going through the machine. I'm surprised at that because normally you can set the machine pretty good. Yeah, yeah, oh, it was something like that anyway. It was, mm. um, yeah, yeah, 3 okay. or 4%. Yeah. But with less stock around, like people say, oh, well, we're just going to get the sheep to eat it. They do eat it if they're in full pod a lot easier than if they're uh, on the ground. The trouble with the, the full pod in the ground is once the sun gets on it, they tend to split open. And the seed then on the ground, the, the sheep tend to pick up the ones they can see and stand on the others. We're in a full pod, they can eat the lot. So some suggest that crash grazing straight after harvest is the best way to get the most of the lupin seed before they all start you know, shedding badly on the ground. But there's less people now with sheep to do that. So uh, yeah, that's that's a problem. I think it's better to get it in the bin first and then feed it back to them. Okay. Any Any last comments at your end, Rob, or anyone else? No, just we had different issues this year. We had soil type issues. They all germinated on some soil types and we've got totally bare patches where they weren't exactly happy with their depth on other soil types. Hmm. But that's that's a one-off issue, I think, just it was drying soil conditions and, yeah, just a particular year problem. So you're thinking the surface dried out, Rob, so that uh, they, they didn't germinate because it got too dry at the top and there's perhaps the lighter soil, is it? Yeah, it was sort of sand over clay for some reason. They dried out. Whether the trenches were slightly more open and they were very slightly shallower, I don't know, but it didn't seem to be that much difference when you dig them up, but it's pretty much a line in the paddock where they grew or didn't grow, and it's definitely a soil change. Okay. The other thing I do suggest with lupins is not to have too much press wheel pressure on them. I tend to back it off to just about dead weight for lupins or any any dicot, even canola. Anything that's got to pull its seed coat out through the surface, don't want too much pressure above the seed. Um, and uh, generally press wheels are about four kilos per centimetre width and I tend to back it off to about two, which is about the, the dead weight of most press wheels. But in some of our other lupin work, zero was as good as, as no pressure, you know, or no pressure was as good as any pressure. Because I think it's just, yeah, if the surface gets too hard. And the other problem is it's pressed, it can actually wick the moisture out. So it can dry out quicker if it's pressed. So I tend to use a ring harrow behind the press wheels just to bring some loose soil back in on top to uh, uh, stop that wicking problem. But wicking is not necessarily a problem on the lighter sand. It's more of the clays. You get wicking the moisture out. And we're actually trying a coil press wheel this year too, because it seems to do the best of both it doesn't it still presses around the seed but leaves it less crusty on the surface so we're going to try that for particularly our heavier clays anyway but uh, it could be a, could be an interesting all-rounder as well so we're experimenting with that this year i think we might uh, wrap it up there um thank you glenn for your time today and um preparing your presentation and um thanks to grdc for funding this work and we will call it a day. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um, we'll, we will post this up online. So if you want to go back and have a look and at any of the details or share it with some with your neighbour, um, it'll be up there on the Levy website. So um, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Glenn. No worries. Thanks. Thank you.